Alwood and I had to be the only two beings on earth, crossing the Bay Bridge in a silver beetle, rehearsing phrases in Arabic in March of 1965. The radio was blaring that two Marine battalions had arrived the day before on China Beach at Da Nang. Malcolm's assassinated February 25th, and LBJ approves troops to go to Nam on February 26th. No coincidence, Alwood said. As we came out of the Treasure Island Tunnel onto the San Francisco side of the bridge, I could tell Alwood was pushing his buttocks down into the seat by the way he was gripping the handle on the dashboard. I pushed the four $1 bills that the toll collector had given me into my jeans pocket. We were headed for the Black House in the Fillmore. Alwood, do you think pushing your ass into the seat is going to stop the bridge from swaying? You're driving too fast, Janice, he said, craning his neck to check my speed. He was right. As-salam alaykum. Alwood said it for the umpteenth time, enunciating every syllable. Wa alaykum as-salam, I said, trying unsuccessfully not to say while the lakums of the salami brother, sister, but only the most, <laughs> most high potentate. Alwood shook his head. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I take it back, I said. I put it all back in my mouth. The San Francisco skyline, the offices full of yellow light and reflected dusk, glittered. Alwood sighed. I drove to Fell Street and went up the hill, practicing and being corrected, until we reached Divisadero Street, where I broke. They will not let me in if I don't say this exactly right. Kick me into the street if I say it wrong. Who is the boss of Salam and Salakum anyway? <laughs> Tell me, it sounds like Abbott and Costello meeting up as sheets on the street. Believe it or not, Alwood said, you're going to like it. We finally parked at Hayes and Broderick. I don't see a black house, I said. It's not painted black, Alwood said, steering me. Behind the wheel of the VW, the gear shift in my palm, I was in charge since Allwood couldn't drive a stick. But outside that cooped up space, I waited for his arm to tell me which was the right house. God, San Francisco was such a thief, a lady of the night, a sorceress with her hands out. Every time, all my years as a child, that we crossed the bridge, we had to pay to get in, pay to get out, pay for every little thing. Oakland was free, San Francisco was not. Pay me, pay me, pay for the Pacific Ocean and the beach. I am expensive, the city always said, so pay me for my wonderful dark treats like the Star Steinhardt Aquarium with its dark wide hall lit up by tank after tank of bright gold, green, blue, sharks, dolphins, whales, stinger fish, cold eyed, still as a corpse fish that didn't blink or budge when we tapped the thick glass with our fingernails. Pay, the voice said, to whomever took us on Sunday to the Flyshacker Zoo. Even as I stood in front of the fat lady whose cackling, gap tooth, 12 foot high, 12 feet high, three feet wide body made me laugh for a solid hour, even as I collapsed in tears, driven out of my eyes by laughter, I understood that the other name for San Francisco wasn't Frisco, it was Pay you dumb jerks from Oakland. <laughs> God, would I ever grow up. As-salam alaykum, I said as we walked up the balustraded stairway. Wa alaykum salam, he said back and rang the bell. The front door had leaded stained glass windows on each side. I peered through one, and a man with skin the color of a Hershey bar and teeth a stunning white uh, came, came up to the door. Even though I saw him, when he opened the door, he startled me. Alwood gave the Muslim greeting. Wa alaikum salam, brother Alwood. The man's tone was so deep it rumbled. He took my coat from me. Inside, I saw San Francisco once again in the dense, narrow, vertical interior. I was almost dizzy with expectation. Is this the sister's first time here, he said to Alwood. I couldn't let him not talk to me. Assalamu alaikum, I said proudly, his bushy eyebrows raised. I'm Jenny's Hightower. I've never been here before. I extended my hand to him. He looked at it and laughed. You niggas from Oakland is quaint. <laughs> niggas from Oakland? 
Did he sing that? Did his voice go up on niggas and back down on Oakland? Whatever was coming from his dark neck was like a boat bobbing on an ocean. I couldn't take my eyes from it. This is our fortress against the wolf, he said, leading up the stairs. A hand-lettered sign hung between the sconces. In the beginning, all the world was blackness. They changed the quote. I immediately remembered from Western Civ and John Locke. In the beginning, all the world was America. It, it, was, it was of a piece with the Grove Street orators that I always saw in front of Oakland City College. So smart, so seemingly University of California bound, yet not. So Harvard, yet not. And here I was in this grand Victorian transformed by blackness with a capital B. The wolf, I said and felt this quivery knot in my stomach. <clears throat> He laughed so hard, I thought I should stop asking questions. Everybody, the system, the world, the city, the garbage in the streets, the past, the present, maybe the future, he raised his cold black eyebrows. Street niggas come up with a lot of existential rhetoric, too. Bebo, all would addressed him. Your name is Bebo? What a crazy sounding name. Yeah, you want to check my birth certificate? Bebo. What time does it start? All its voice grounded me. The music or the speeches, good brother? The speeches. Speeches for the good brother Allwood right in the Malcolm X door. The brother pointed to a closed door. Allwood squeezed my arm. I watched wordless as Allwood walked in and the door closed behind him. You belong in here. Bebo steered me toward a kitchen where a woman was stirring something that smelled like lamb and garlic in a pan. He disappeared down the hall. He meant to direct me to the kitchen, and I do know about manners, but from the other side of the house, I heard drums, vibrations, thumping. Somebody blowing poetry like a saxophonist was inside his throat. I followed the sounds to another house connected by a passageway. I bobbed along, dealing with a ferocious conga beat. That was when I saw dancers. The first thing I noticed was dark, dark sisters, their hair trimmed and moving with their bodies like fitted caps. It was a dark world, and I fit, or so I thought until I looked in the mirror, where their torsos twisted around me like serpents. I looked like a Tarzan native on a Hollywood movie set. I looked wild and untamed, countrified. The dancers had sculpted afros. I had hair all over the place. The dancers had African print draped around them. I had on frayed jeans. The sheer exertion of their bodies pounding, feet stomping, and hands tapping brought up images of my family, the side where light people, the high yellow side, just had to be light. That's all. Be light, and that's all. The women who were light didn't even have to know how to dance. Just be light, which made them pretty. I knew the browner people in the family could be smart as hell. It was never enough. If you were brown, you better know how to do something and do it well. Even then, you didn't get slack. My cousin Clovis had her picture in her paper at work. I could tell she was real proud of it because she made copies and gave them around. But I heard my aunt say, mm, so dark you can hardly see her. I headed for the kitchen. The woman there was slight, with kumquat, smooth, dark skin, an ankle-length skirt draped on her. She didn't see me. And I didn't want her to turn around and catch me staring at her. The smell of what she was cooking, taken together with her appearance, was enough. I was hearing the words, Ali Baba and the 40 Thieves and Asalaamu Alaikum in a jumble in my head. If I saw her from the front, a snake might spring from the top of her head and twist over and grab me for myself. No, I wanted to shout at her. No, you can't have it. I own it. I wanted to take in this blackness, but I didn't want to drown in it. People who were radical and black or part of the resistance to the man and the system had confidence oozing out of them. They seemed to never doubt themselves. I wasn't like that. I turned and walked down the hall to find Allwood, my security blanket. I couldn't find the door. I got stuck in the hall. Where was Allwood who had gotten me into this? I had to go into one of the rooms. What if I walked in on somebody doing it? House parties always had a bedroom upstairs where somebody dumb would happen on somebody not so dumb. <laughs> but this wasn't a house party. I took a deep breath and opened the door with a poster of Malcolm X on it. Some people think this is paradise, California. We're free. The South is behind us. 
Jim Crow is behind us. The ocean is our frontier now. We're a part of the wild, wild west. Don't believe it. The speaker's voice was high-pitched and familiar. It was Friedman from Oakland City College standing there in that room, a bedroom, a bedroom auditorium. The room had four rows of wooden folding chairs with an aisle about a foot wide, but the room was lopsided because everybody was sitting on one side. The men looked alike, unsmiling with big afros. I was escorted to the empty side. I became aware of my jeans so tight and frayed on the inside of my thigh. You're not a part of paradise for you, the speaker said. For you, California is paradise with rules, a paradise for fools. And the main rules for Negroes, that is, the unschooled fools who still call themselves Negroes, the main rule is, he broke off there and started laughing. In all those lunch times, I had watched him with the Grove Street orators and taken leaflets for fair play for Cuba from him. I had never seen him look jive or relaxed. But he was laughing, a deep, hearty laugh, shaking his entire torso. How could he shake and bellow like that here in this foggy, black heart of San Francisco and never have seemed at ease even once in the sunshine and touch me I'm blue skies of Oakland? Wait! The word hit the room like a thunderclap. I started in my seat. I needed to go to the bathroom, but even more urgently needed to get his point. I was following him like I'd followed preachers' interminable sermons on Sunday afternoon. Only then I waited for the preachers, who as a class my uncle labeled ignorant, to say something ungrammatical or simple so I could dismiss the whole sermon. But the Grove Street orators were different. They were book smart. That's what the man insists that you do, he continued. Wait for justice, wait for equality, Wait until he gets ready to give you freedom, to give you justice, to hand out equality on a silver platter. The men started clapping. I clapped with them. They stopped. I put my hands back on my lap. He cleared his throat like a reverend. Hmm, did God awaken him in the night with the next day's sermon? A God like Malcolm X or Marcus Garvey or Elijah Muhammad or maybe Nat Turner? And then he concocts a rationale for why you have to wait. Not why you should wait, why you gonna wait, dig it. He gets some Irish cracker who's probably been to Harlem twice in his whole life to put together a report and put his name on it. Yeah, the Moynihan Report. Oh, this was all its territory. I was on familiar turf here. Yeah, the Moynihan Report, which just means some potato farmer's great-grandson is getting over on you making his name, his rep, paying for his wife to hire your mama to make her dinner and wash her underwear out by hand and sending his kids to a college you couldn't get in if you had straight A's and perfect SATs. I know because I was one of the first Negroes at Harvard. Went in a Negro, invisible and all that shit, came out a black man. Had to. It was either break through to my blackness or die. And you see me standing here. The men clapped in unison. When I clapped, I broke the oneness. Yeah, Moynihan. The very name makes me want to take somebody out. <laughs> Moynihan says the Negro community has been forced into a matriarchal structure, which, because it's so out of line with the rest of American society, dig that, you out of line Negroes. He says, we seriously retard the progress of the group as a whole. I still needed to pee. <laughs> but the speaker was up to the clincher here in this bedroom auditorium. I don't know, but I got a daddy for your ass. This Looney Tune white man is the USA, your Uncle Sam, and the same mothers and fathers he's disparaging, which is a fancy white man's term for putting your ass down. Those same black people are paying his salary, slaving, paying taxes so the man can write this bullshit, get a PhD off of it, and keep you down where you can't even get up and fight because you busy trying to prove to him that what he's saying ain't so, which he knows already, and that's why he puts it out there. So you'll spend the next 25 years trying so hard to disprove a lie that it begins to sound like the truth. 
and Moynihan, some potato farmer's great grandson, gets called a prophet. He was through. I had attended enough church to know that. The men began clapping. We don't need no hand clapping. They stopped. And we don't need no more Jesuses. One was enough to keep us under the yoke for 400 years. Well, I didn't see a collection plate, so I got up and slithered out so I wouldn't have to shake hands with the right reverend. But he called my name before I could get to the door. Sister Hightower, he said. He remembered my byline from City College. Is this your first time at the Black House? How could he tell? Are you reporting on this? No, 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 I came with Allwood. Don't be embarrassed, he said. Oh shit, he can read my mind. You're not dressed the way the sisters dress here. He pointed me with his hand on my elbow back to the kitchen. Fatima will give you the word. She's a Nubian sister. Queens speak a language only other queens can understand. Dig? Nubian? I asked. Yeah, new being, new being. That's the word here. I had no choice, it seemed, but to return. Fatima stood in the kitchen, smiling at me as if she had been waiting for me all night. I touched my hair. It felt wiry and woolly. She smiled again. You are a queen. Beautiful, she said. I didn't know what to say. Beautiful? What kind of word was that to be connected with me? I had been called cute and dark, sexy and dark, long-legged and dark. Beautiful? You've never been called that, have you? A queen, she asked, her voice soft and rich. Oh, never, I said. Napoleon knows, had been one of my nicknames from the cousins. I had a small waist and pretty feet, my one physically perfect feature. Men had singled out parts as, as if the whole was worth very little but the parts could be worth something at auction. <laughs> I, I never believed men who said I was fine because I thought they used the word interchangeably with the thought of wanting to fuck me. The brother who had called her a Nubian came to the kitchen. Tightening her up, he said, Harris, Fatima's large brown eyes seemed to pour the word out to him. She had been cooking for him, I was sure. He turned to talk to someone down the hall. Let the white kids lead a palace revolt. Let the white man be divided. Divided he falls, united we stand. When the man closes ranks is when we should be alarmed. That's when he's at his deadliest. He turned back to me and said to Fatima, Lumumba, Patrice Lumumba. She's got that same steady look in her eyes. She's got a chilling thing going down in her eyes. Yeah. My only frame of reference for anybody's Lumumba was a dark as night boy in high school with very African features. From the South, he wore big bend overalls and clunky workman, working man shoes, and kids called him Lumumba. He had a crush on me, and my friends had made fun of me because of it. They had called me Lumumba's wife, which I had hated. When Harris walked away, I felt free to ask Fatima, am I seeing things wrong? Or do I just happen to see a lot of light-skinned brothers in the movement with darker-skinned sisters? She laughed, a tinkly, crystal laugh. You picked up on that, huh? These brothers have an elevated consciousness, and yes, they're trying to prove something. Allwood is your man, right? I shrugged. She smiled like she knew something I didn't. Harris, Allwood, our light-skinned men in the movement, they feel deeply about us as sisters as beautiful black women. But is it overcompensation, I asked? Maybe you see it as overcompensation. When you look outwardly, unless you look in the mirror, you can't see yourself. You can't see if you're skinny or fat or white or black. You see the people around you. Whatever they are, that's what you are. When you wake up in the morning, you wake up human. No age, no color, and no sex until your eye hits either a mirror or another person, then it's instant. That's who you are who you sleep with, who you eat with. So I think these brothers have grown to resent being categorized and put down because of their light skin. They're trying to prove who they are inside so they won't be judged by the outside. I felt a sense of alarm. Will they dump the dark skin sister once they've made their point? <laughs> she laughed again. Did Malcolm leave Betty? Malcolm X's wife was dark skinned? Fatima got a book from the stack on the table and showed me Betty Shabazz's picture. Brother Malcolm's overcompensation benefited us all. 
He became as powerful as we are. He exposed us to our power, and that was his power. That's why they had to kill him. She put the book back and walked behind me. Let me show you something. With one deft movement of her hands, she twisted my hair tighter than I had ever twisted it into a ponytail. She pulled me up, and we went to the mirror in the hall. I looked at her hands, at her long, smooth fingers with their white half moons. Do you see how different you look with your hair off your face? For so long I had used my hair as my shield. To see myself in front of her as I saw myself in the morning was a shock. You are a beautiful woman, she said. She turned my chin from side to side. Look at your face, your jaw, those beautiful planes. Look at the light picking them out. You're a thousand years old. They couldn't beat the African out of you. They couldn't fuck it out. She wouldn't let go of my head. One hand held my hair tight, held my hair tight from my scalp, and her other hand, satin soft and cool, cupped my chin. You have to say it, she said. Say what? I am such a beautiful woman. I said it quickly. No, say it slowly, looking at yourself, not me. I said it again, but, but it was hard not to look at her. She was beautiful. Look at you. No man can make you unbeautiful. Say it as if it meant all the golden creation was inside your beauty, inside you. I looked at that mirror and saw the Janice she saw. I wasn't only parts put together. She let go of my hair. It went back all over the place. But it didn't matter. I was not my hair or my pretty feet that no one ever saw first or any other part, not even my mind. I was a whole new being that this woman had shown me. Bebo came sauntering down the hall and grabbed my arm, pulling me away. Fatima smiled and watched as we walked away. He wasn't so overpowering. He wasn't overcompensating either. We went to another part of the house, but he kept pouring poetic shit into my ear. Elvis ripped off Big Mama Thornton, the hound dog. Jughead was an agent provocateur for the FBI. Millie the model had silicone implants, but we didn't want to hear it. Yeah, true romance tears stop where the real ones start. Ike was a colored man. Dinah Shore is a fugitive from the Negro race. Sammy Davis Jr. got that empty eye socket from the mob. Little Lotta's fat comes from the diethyl still best girl and all those hamburgers she stuffed down a fat white gut. Even if we heard it, it would have gone in one ear and out the other. Archie and Veronica freaked on a daddy's bed. You gotta use your imagination. Otherwise, you'll just be thinking some guy's peeing inside you. Richie Rich made his money from black sugar workers in rural Cuba. Louie Louie was a flasher. Nkrumah has led Ghana into the future fabulous. He walked toward Alwood, who was waiting with his coat on. And Alwood looked strange, as if I had gone away and we were connecting after a long absence. Are you ready? Alwood asked, one hand on the door. When we got outside, the cold night air fell right on the spots where Fatima had held my chin. Yeah, finally, I said. The next day, I went to the barber shop and had my hair cut into a natural. Sleek, short, very African. Woo!